So this being our first session, first DNI in the workplace session for the year, our topic very aptly is common mistakes to avoid in 2023 with regard to the EIB in the workplace. So for all those who don't know, we will be saying the DEI, DEIB in the session a lot. So DEIB stands for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I'm going to start by introducing myself and describing myself. We do this to be inclusive of people who are visually impaired, uh, who may have joined us today or may watch this video later. So hello, everybody. I am Sainthini. I am your moderator for today. Um, this is my first time moderating, so please be kind to me. <laughs> uh, I am the community manager at Diversify and Her Space. Um, I am a brown woman with black mid-length curly hair. I'm wearing a light purple turtleneck and I have my glasses on. Uh, behind me, you can see a black screen and uh, you can see the light reflected on it. Not a great place to sit, I just realized. But... Well, uh, so today we are joined by three very incredible and powerful DEI practitioners as speakers. We have Samudeze, Astrid Sundberg, and Dr. Purnima Lutra with us today. I'm sure most of you had heard them at some of our panel discussions. So I hope you're ready to learn, question, and reflect on what is being said here today. And now on to our speakers. Can you briefly introduce and describe yourselves? Uh, we can start with Chisom because you're the first on my screen. Thanks, Shantani. Thank you're doing great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chisom Udeze. Um, I am an economist and a diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging enthusiast, uh, uh, strategist, um, and consultant. And lately, I'm also quite into the perception, uh, the perspective around justice and decolonization as well within DEIB. Uh, really excited to be here. I'm also the founder of Diversify. Uh, so really excited to be here and to speak with you know, both Astrid and Dr. Ponima, who are absolutely brilliant uh, in, in this work and in the way they push and shake things. Um, I am a Black woman uh, sitting, as usual, behind my boring off whitish wall, um, wearing a Black torso neck uh, sweater. And uh, I have twists, uh, long twists, so you can't really see where it ends. And uh, yeah, I think that's perhaps all the description I can think of of myself today. And of course, I, I, I just probably worth saying, I have a sore throat. Uh, so I figured at, you know, the worst, it makes me sound sexy, but in case I need to go off screen to like blow my nose, you know why. <laughs> so there we go. Thanks, Shantani. You want to go next? Yes. Um, hi, uh, hi everyone, and um, big hello to all the panelists, and um, and good luck, Santani, as well with the with the session today. Um, it's really good to be back at a diversity and inclusion in the workplace session. Um, my name is Astrid Sundberg. Um, I'm a, a white woman, 49 years old. I'm wearing a, a chunky knit sweater today in cream. Um, uh, my big round throwback 70s glasses. Um, dark blondish hair, kind of the colour of dirty dishwater, and, um, and I'm in my home office. And um, I'm a, an experienced leader and director specialising in the people and talent space for more than 20 years now. I'm currently working as the Global Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Alda, who are the uh, largest online grocery retailer in Norway. Um, we have uh, 900 employees uh, and a presence in both Finland and Germany as well. I've been in this role for nearly two years and in that time had the opportunity to, to launch a global diversity and inclusion strategy, as well as leading the um, high impact diversity change initiatives and campaigns to support the beginnings of our EDI journey. So today's topic is, is really close to my heart. Um, because although I've been working with a conscious focus on DIB for many years, the last two years have been with a real specialist focus. And um, 
I've learned a lot about uh, what to do and, and, and what not to do, I suppose you could say. So I'm a huge supporter of the work being undertaken by Her Space and Diversify. It's a pleasure to be back here on, I think this is my fifth panel. Um, so thank you very much for having me back. Thank you, Astrid. On to you, Purnima. Hi everyone, um, a very good afternoon uh, here from Copenhagen um, and I can see lots of people from around the world. So I'm in Singapore, which is home for me. And um, also I think there was someone from Bangalore, India as well, which is where my family's from. So, and of course, all of our Nordic friends, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll start with a description. I'm an Indian woman, 42 years old. Um, I've got a uh, black hair with curls, and um, I've got my bookshelf in the background with a couple of pillows uh, as well. Um, I go by the pronouns she, her, and uh, I'm associate professor at the Copenhagen Business School, and um, I'm also an author, and I've written two books, Diversifying Diversity and the Art of Active Allyship, which was just launched last week. Um, so really delighted to be here. Um, I, I love the collaboration with Diversify and with Her Space. And I think this is my third time speaking uh, on, on these platforms. So very grateful for this opportunity to share my work, share my thoughts. Um, I've been involved in the DI space well before it became the topic to be talking about. Um, so um, I started off with doing uh, research in the area as an academic, and that has progressed into um, taking my academic work uh, much more into the practitioner um, space, uh, working with companies, both private and humanitarian organizations as well. So really delighted to be here. Thank you so much. And Santana, you're doing brilliantly. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to link um, Dr. Purnima's books in the chat so you can take a look at it. And now moving on to my first question. My first question is for the three of you. So as we dive into the topic of common mistakes to avoid in uh, 2023, as DEI practitioners, what themes are present for each one of you? Uh, let's start with Astrid. Um, yes, thank you um, for the thank you for the question. Um, I'd say that there's three very clear areas for me. Um, performative diversity. Um, that would be the first one. Um, flaky commitments to workplace diversity and inclusion. I think I'd say that's my second one. And um, the third area for me on this topic would be this perception of diversity and inclusion roles being a luxury add on or a nice to have. What about you, Chisa? Um, I say for me, what is present is, I guess, the need to probably along the lines of what Astrid has shared, like the need to uh, do a deeper dive beyond the surface uh, into, you know, intersectional challenges, as well as systemic and structural barriers, you know. So, for example, I want us to take on the topic of anti-racism and anti-Blackness. I want us to take on the topic of trans uh, inclusion and also the inclusion of people from the global majority within the LGBTQ community, you know, especially for those who identify outside of the binary or outside of the heteronormative agenda. I want to have real and authentic conversation, no matter how uncomfortable they are, and ideally see workplaces and society implement solutions that actually make a difference. So I do want to see workplaces, you know, action in the talk, not just talking the talk, but doing the work necessary to effect the type of change that we need to see to, you know, move the needle. Thank you, Jason. Dr. Purnima. So I have, um, you know, building on what both Astrid and Chizoma said, the three things that are on my mind this year, um, very much uh, like what Chizoma said, intersectionality is huge right now. I think we've been focusing on certain groups uh, within our workplaces and elevating and providing spaces and lifting. But I really think 2023 is should be uh, the year where we pivot from that to really truly being inclusive across intersectional identities. And that relates very much into the space of active allyship, 
and really truly showing up as active allies, not just for some groups that are within our comfort um, and people that we're comfortable with, um, but really, really pushing the needle on being intersectionally uh, active in our allyship across identities. So for me, that's big. And I would say I had a wonderful conversation yesterday with a chief people officer of a company and uh, very, very ahead of their game, I would say. I don't see a lot of companies doing this, but really embedding DEI into the fabric of organizational life, not as an add-on, you know, related to what you said, Astrid, as well, not just the roles, but also the strategy, uh, not being seen as an add-on, uh, like a separate pillar, uh, but really embedding the key tenets of DEI within structures, systems, policies, practices, and strategies. <laughs> This is the direction that I would um, I'd really like uh, like us to be going in. Thank you, um, Dr. Purnima. Uh, I just want to remind everybody to keep yourselves muted. Um, now continuing with questions. Um, so Purnima just uh, mentioned. And even during her planning session, during our planning session, Dr. Purnima mentioned that uh, having a DEI strategy is only the starting point. So Astrid, my next question is for you. As the director of uh, DEI at UDA, what are some of the learnings that you have gained from implementing a DEI strategy? And perhaps what would you do differently? Um, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> There's been a lot of um, teachable moments for me um, in the last two years and, and the teams that I've worked with, be that TA and people teams, um, leadership teams, or the employee resource groups that I've led. And, and I think the focus on um, allyship at order has been really beneficial for, for starting conversations and, and sort of picking up difficult and difficult topics and um, yeah, uncomfortable themes or themes that some people might find uncomfortable. So we've, we've had a, a powerful community sort of quite united with our employee resource groups and, and that has had a wonderful ripple effect. <clears throat> I think the biggest learning for me um, in the here and now is about the importance to keep the strategy as simple as possible. Because I think that in companies like ours, uh, where there's um, a very strategic approach, a lot of people from the consultancy environment, um, as well as, uh, you know, uh, as, as well as the importance of having a strategy, my belief is that sort of simplicity helps to engage people. So one learning for me was launching um, a call to action with four key areas to encourage this sort of participation from all corners of the organization. So I think don't overcomplicate your strategy with too much what I call big deck energy. Um, another learning is probably the maintain, maintaining of, of patience and, and tenacity, um, especially when you're navigating all of the inevitable, inevitable changes of a role like this in the corporate landscape. Um, bumps in the road. I mean, last year, for example, um, I had a change in leadership. Um, we cut many departmental budgets because of the changes in the uh, economy, including the DI budget, which put a, a delay on a proposed global training program. Um, eventually, I managed to find a solution um, by applying for a, a government grant from the Norwegian Directorate of Integration and Diversity, which means that I've been able to design and curate a, a global leadership program called all inclusive, which is being launched next month. So I think this tenacity um, and outside the box thinking, which led to an external collaboration with, uh, with MD in the end, that's really something that I credit for enabling a, a high impact initiative to go ahead. And just lastly, I think on things that I do differently, um, I think I might have seen greater benefit with more support from top leadership in the company, if I'm being honest. And I'm not actually pointing fingers there at anyone else, just that perhaps I could have navigated that more effectively from my end to get senior leaders involved. Um, and, and just in terms of what helped me reading and, and, and learning, particularly from the um, from anti-racist advocates and practitioners, which has been a really important part of understanding sort of these layers of 
historical systemic discrimination, what oppression is, how power and privilege show up. Well, that's been a huge, uh, I guess, important um, learning to the journey that I've been on and, and integral to the role. Thank you so much, Astrid, for that. My next question is for Dr. Purnima. So continuing on the question of DEI strategy, um, do you think it is enough for companies to have a DEI strategy or roadmap? And what do you think keeps them from, you know, going beyond strategy and making the necessary changes for more inclusive recruitment, promotion, or even like payment or opportunities? Yeah, so I'll build on my what I shared earlier as well, right? So I think we do need focus areas, we need a strategy in that sense, but I also think that we need to be moving away from having that separate DI strategy that seems like it's an add on to other aspects. And what that does is it does two things. One, it it and it creates a silo of that DI is something that is separate and other than, um, and it's a good to have, as Astrid said earlier, good to have in good times, and we don't really need it when we're, when we're perhaps going through uh, times of recession, for example, or, uh, or economic difficulties. So I think that it's really important for us to be thinking about a DI strategy that is embedded within, so moving away from that mindset of it being separate. The second thing for me is a DI strategy can sometimes give the uh, a false sense of security that we have something, we're doing something, it's plastered on our website, we have images that go with it, we're doing something. And that can give leaders, but also employees, a false sense of security. Now, as I often say, uh, inclusion isn't felt through a DI strategy. You can have the best words, you can play around with it, you can have your best marketing team design a beautiful slogan and all of that but that's not where inclusion lies inclusion is felt in our day-to-day -day interactions right it's at meetings it's at lunch it's at the by the coffee machine and that's where it felt and because inclusion is felt in those spaces it is important for us to ensure that our di strategy is embedded into the day-to-day -day things that we do Yes, part of it is around recruitment and selection. Part of it is around pay equity. Part of it is around even the products and services that we're designing, the customer service. But it's also around interactions, whether it's out with external stakeholders and perhaps more importantly, internal, our people with each other, that's where it lies. And I think this false sense of security is something that companies need to come out of and realize that you can have all of those wonderful things but until and unless we move the needle on actually embedding inclusive practices and having a zero tolerance for anything that is non-inclusive, um, that is when we'll really move the needle. So for me, uh, you need the DI strategy. I'm not saying that you don't, but make sure it's embedded and make sure that it's not a false, a false gives you a false sense of security. Yeah. Thank you, Purnima. It's so important to work towards true inclusion and inclusion of the 100%. Uh, I also just want to remind everybody to put in your questions if you have any. We would love to hear your questions so our speakers can address them at the end of the session and just preface them with a question and write the name of the speaker if it is directed towards, if it is directed towards a particular person and we will look into it after we finish this part. So my next question is for you, Chisholm. Um, let's talk about who we center in DEIB work. So a lot of the DEIB work unintentionally centers a cisgendered, heteronormative and white lens. Even when we highlight the importance of inclusion, equity and justice, for example, we continue to center the norm. Why do you think that is and what can we do to dismantle this? Uh, thank you, Shantani. Uh, I'm going to jump on, uh, I think Dr. Pornima had said earlier about a lot of the work around DI, you know, tends to center a particular lens, a particular group of people. And I think this question, you know, derives from that as well. You know, I think maybe some of us here have read 
the quotes that go something like diversity asks who's at the table, equity asks who's not at the table and what barriers do they face in getting here, inclusion asks uh, has everyone been heard, and justice asks would your ideas be taken seriously if they are not part of the majority. I mean this is a fantastic quote. The problem however is that this quote still centers whiteness and it still centers the majority. So if we approach it from a decolonization perspective, then the first question we need to be asking before we get into the DEI stuff is who built the table and why was it built in the first place? I think that even as practitioners, we must continue to critically assess our perspectives and unlearn passively accept norms. You know, yesterday I was having uh, our bi-weekly uh, workplace discussion uh, with my team, you know, and I mentioned, you know, we cannot design, you know, something around, like you cannot design a project or an initiative without the inclusion of those for whom that initiative is meant to serve or elevate. And then I got thinking about power and privilege. We cannot dismantle centering without factoring in who has power in the first place. Like if I'm designing something, say for example, for the LGBTQ community, there is already a, a power imbalance and I should not be leading that project. Somebody within that community should be leading that project with my support, you know? So I think it's always important to ask ourselves very critically from which lens are we viewing this from? And I admittedly, you know, like I've, I've gone through like a process of just like reevaluating a lot of the work I do and also asking myself questions in terms of who is this made for? Who is centered in this conversation? Who is centered in this initiative? You know, are we viewing it from say like uh, a majority, say in this case, white person perspective and worried about white fragility? Are we viewing it from the lens of the cisgendered, people and then not thinking about others who are within the LGBTQ community? Are we viewing it from a Christian perspective? Are we viewing it from a right-handed perspective? Because we don't tend to think about the challenges that left-handed people in the world face in using tools that were made and curated for you know, people who are right-handed. So we always need to ask and challenge this passively accepted norms and then commit to doing better because we need to remember that we are not the norm. No matter how perceptive and inclusive we think we are, we tend to forget that we're not the norm. So we think, yeah, everyone should behave like this. This is what I think is palatable. This is what I think is not rude. This is what I think is the appropriate way to behave. And we need to challenge ourselves in thinking like this. Uh, I think as Dr. Ponyuma said as well earlier, and I, I think Astrid, you know, we need to think about how we can fully embed and integrate DEIB across an organization from a strategic and cultural perspective. And we need to do it from a decentering perspective, asking is everybody who should lead this or be a part of this, are they leading this? Are they in the room? And just lastly, you know, uh, uh, we can't fix all the problems in the world as Astrid alluded to. So it's always great to pick, you know, a few areas to work on and then start the centering from there. So I think this is how we start to dismantle it. Thank you so much, Chisum. That is so much to think about. <laughs> um, Astrid, Chisum mentioned the concept of whiteness and white fragility in the last question. So as a white woman, can you speak more to this reality and what can white leaders or companies do to unlearn this trend? You're, you're muted, Astrid. Sorry, my, um, uh, my, my bad. Um, thank you for the question, and um, and Chisholm, thank you for those insights around passively accepted norms as well. Um, that sort of leads into my answer to some extent, I suppose. Um, some some people, some some white people, that is, um, bristle um, at the word white being used. Um, there's an assumption that it's being used in a derogatory context, oftentimes. 
And, and, the, and this term, which I think just background here, was popularized by uh, Robin DiAngelo in a book called uh, White Fragility, um, examined this phenomenon by which white people can become angry and, um, and, and, and defensive or, or hostile when they're confronted with the idea of systemic racism. Um, so this, this, this concept, this book examined the origins in the failure of white people in society to understand the existence of structural racism. Um, most import important of all was that the white fragility con uh, concept or phrase, um, it, it made a case for why it's essential for white people to understand and actually acknowledge the existence of white supremacy in order to sort of do the difficult work of, of, of challenging it. So that's a place to start for, for, for leaders or anyone working in this space and speaking for how I try to navigate this as a leader, um, I try to be mindful um, that, that my voice uh, as a white woman certainly doesn't belong in every space. Um, I try to stay in my lane. Um, I try to focus on building trust and cultivating psychological safety, um, particularly when I'm working with people from the global majority in this space. And while I may have experienced gender-based discrimination, um, that's sort of a, a strong belonging badge for me personally, I will never experience racism, ableism, you know, transphobia, uh, Islamophobia, and neither should I center my trauma uh, over other traumas or, or, or align it with others. So that's a balancing act. And, and I'm absolutely sure that I've made mistakes and will continue to make mistakes. Um, but for me, this um, empathy for lived experiences is a necessity as a, as a white woman in this space. I think active listening counts for a lot because active listening, it helps you to avoid centering your own experiences and it helps to cultivate this idea of holding space and, 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 and creating space for others. And I think really navigating the role with a sort of, you know, deep level of integrity, authenticity, owning mistakes, learning from them. And for sure, I, uh, I think it wouldn't be natural if I didn't question whether I have the right to be in a role like this or, or, or question my whiteness in the role I do. I, I wouldn't be approaching the work from the right mindset. Um, and so that's also an essential part of my learning, the realization that there is a privilege that my whiteness affords me. And the uncomfortable truth is sometimes it might be easier to challenge white people on whiteness and white discomfort as a white person because some white people are more likely to listen to another white person and let's just unpick that because that in itself is because of internalized white supremacy i think the last thing i'd just say is that um when this has come up in discussions which it has when i've done this uh, while i've been doing this role particularly for the last two years um, I've commonly heard people say things like white people can have it tough too, you know, this sort of what aboutery or white aboutery is it sometimes called. And, um, and yes, that's true. White privilege doesn't mean that you haven't had a difficult life with disadvantages. But what I try to say is what it does mean is that your skin color won't be a factor in any of the disadvantages you experience. And that means that you don't have to worry about being followed in a store or being an affirmative action hire if you get a, a top job or being racially, racially profiled at airport security or a neighbor asking what you're doing outside your own front door or where you are really from. So that's a lens that I've used for trying to frame it in some of those difficult, challenging and un uncomfortable conversations that can come from this. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid, for sharing your insights and also for the work that you do and for being an active ally. Um, DEI is a constant process of learning and unlearning. 
And as a woman of Indian heritage, I have had to unlearn so many things that I accepted as the norm in the last few years of engaging with DEIB. I know that different groups, um, whether that be marginalized and underrepresented groups of people or even other South Asians like me, uh, we unintentionally uphold the patriarchy and the oppressive systems that are so deeply rooted and intertwined with culture and values. And these norms are harmful, they, and not just to me and people like me, but they are also discriminatory towards other groups, for example, anti-Blackness. So my question is for Dr. Purnima, uh, have you had any reflections along these lines? And if yes, can you speak more about your reflections? Yeah, sure. Uh, gosh, I've got so much to share here, right? Like, I think there's so much work that all of us need to do. And while I have been in this space for a long time, I don't think my learning has in any way ended. I've got so much unlearning to do myself. I'm right now listening to a book, an audio book, and of course it's available you know, on Amazon. Uh, you, can, you can either do it as an audio book or read the physical book called White Women. And, and, and it's, Chisholm, uh, uh, will you fill in the second part of the subtitle? Thank you, you know it really well. Everything, what, everything you already know about your own racism and what you can do about it. There you go. There you go. Um, it's a book by Regina Jackson and Saira Rao. And Regina Jackson is a Black woman and Saira Rao is a South Asian woman. And the, it's based on their race to dinners that, they, that they've done for years um, in the US. And what they do is they both go um, and, and during a dinner with white women, they have conversations. And it's a pretty hard hitting book. And there are moments in the book, I'm about halfway through when I have had to pause and sit with my own discomfort around some of the things that are being shared. And for me, this is a really big part of this because it makes you question many of the things that you have upheld in the past, but also some of the things we continue to uphold as well. Now, as South Asians and, and for any country around the world that has been colonized before, there is an embedded mindset around colorism and who is considered to be more privileged who is, is the holder of power in, in the systems. And, and that's something that has had an influence on my life and how I have looked at things in the past and made assumptions around who knows the answers, who's better at things, who, is, who, who are the people that I need to hold up? Who do I need to code switch around so that I feel like I fit in? Who do I need to be like? And these have been questions that I've asked myself and continue to ask myself uh, in, the, in my own work in this space. And one of the things I've been reflecting a lot around is where do I and where have I shown up where I'm holding patriarchy up, where I am holding colorism up, where I have in the past conformed to norms, dominant norms, right? And, all of that requires a lot of self-reflection around thinking about, gosh, what have I done in the past that has actually been, been an upholder of all of this? So it's quite tough to do this process, but I would strongly encourage you to do it because I'm doing it now. I, I have done it, of course, before, but I think this book in particular is like unpacking everything out of me and I'm loving it. I'm loving being dismantled in some ways and having to re rebuild myself and my own belief systems um, around this work. So, you know, as a South Asian woman, um, you know, when, when I think about my family and the, and the patriarchy that is upheld in my upbringing, right? Um, whether it's my, not just my immediate family, but more extended family about the role of men in the household, um, the role of skin color. When my babies were born, the first question that was asked was how fair are they? right, from family everywhere around the world. How, what's the skin color? How fair are they, right? We uphold these norms of what is considered to be acceptable, what is considered to be dominant, what, where power and privilege lie. And while I have challenged all of this, I think I feel more motivated to do even more today after reading that book um, than I've ever felt before. So for me, it's colorism, it's classism. Oh my gosh, I haven't even touched on that, right? 
South Asia is full of classism, right? And it's a result of many different things, including colonialism and the impact of, at least within India, I'll speak of India, uh, the impact of the British colonization in transforming what was the caste system that was horizontal into something vertical. Not many people know this actually, that the caste system in India is very much like our Myers-Briggs personality test that was there in the Hindu philosophies and scriptures around, you know, depending on your personality types, you have certain roles that you're better suited for, very similar to personality testing. But when, the, when we were colonized for over 200 years, they, this was what it became, it became vertical, right? The British colonizers wanted to keep the thinkers close to them so that the ideas and uh, knowledge was close to the to the seats of power. They wanted to ensure that the East India trade continued. So the next level in that were the business folk. And then the, the category below that was the warriors, the Kshatriyas, the warriors. They needed the warriors to go out to colonize other lands. And then they needed workers to be able to build the infrastructures in all their colonies. So instead of what was considered to be horizontal, they made it vertical. Now, I did not know this until maybe about 10 years ago. I'm an Indian and I did not know this. And I can guarantee you that there are many Indians out there who don't know this either because it's such a big part of our history, right? It's embedded into everything that we do from marriage to job opportunities, to education, to the stamp that is given at birth. So as a South Asian, I need to unpack some of my own learnings. The dowry system is another one that I found out through the movie Enola Holmes. I was watching Enola Holmes with my kids and something came up in the movie and I went, huh? hang on. And this I'm talking about two years ago, right? Um, and, and I said, okay, this is something I need to unpack, right? That the dowry system prior to the British occupying India, women, girls were given uh, given money when they got married to protect them from the fam from their own family that should anything happen that they're safe that they're protected they have land or wealth when when India was colonized uh, there was a law that was put into place that women could not own property and and money any sort of wealth and so the money and the property was given to the husband and their fam and and his family and that's where the dowry system stemmed from and I didn't know this until two years ago. So uh, while I've been in this space for a long time, there's so much work that I've had to do personally and I'm continuing to do because that's an important part of this. We have to unpack, we have to ask the questions, we have to see where these things come from and then we have to challenge it. So one thing is understanding it and then of course allyship and active allyship is about challenging it, challenging it in the spaces that we're in, challenging it with the people that are closest to you, your family, right? Where that's for me the hardest to do is within your personal spaces. So, th so that is, um, that's a big part of my learning and my, my growth as a South Asian. Look, I'm a coconut, what I call myself a coconut. I'm brown on the outside, sometimes white on the inside. I've code switched. I dress a particular way, I speak a particular way so that I can fit in with the norms because otherwise I won't be given a seat at the table, right? I wouldn't be given entry points into spaces. So I am also aware of my own privilege, my own code switching, my own coconut that I am. And in that process, I have a lot of unlearning to do. I have a lot of challenges that, that I need to step up to, to be able to dismantle things around me. So um, I could go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> if I could so just much. add, just quickly to that, Shantani, I think, yes. It's really difficult to, not difficult because a lot of people do it, but I think it's very important to be able to critically like introspect and have like come to Jesus moments with yourself. Like, you know, some of the things uh, Ponima just shared with us is I feel like if you're not able to look internally and say, how do I benefit from the system? What privileges do I have? What have I done that I'm too ashamed to even talk about? You know, how have I code switched? You know, or how have I viewed certain groups of people? I think if we're not able to look at ourselves and say, yeah, we're not perfect. We mess up all the time. It's really going to be difficult to do this work and to do this work with empathy, you know, because 
you need to have empathy for other people to understand where they're coming from because you know that nobody's perfect and everyone is on a journey regardless of where they are at in that journey. Just wanted to add that. Astra, do you want to add something? Um, no, thank you. I, thank you for start sharing the story, Punima. I was just, I was gripped and fascinated by that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Really, thank you, Dr. Punima. I mean, I, there were some things that I knew and like some things I was like, what? I had no idea. <laughs> thank you so much. There's a lot to reflect on. Um, Chisum, my next question is for you. So for those of us who know you, we know that you've had challenges with you know, phrases like BIPOC or people of color. Lately, you've been speaking about reframing what we think we know. Uh, can you speak more about this? For example, who is a member of the minority group or why does people of color exclude white people? White is a color. And how can we use more inclusive language in 2023? Right, thank you. Um... Oh, I think it 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 also kind of just builds on who and what we center. Um, and I think that it very much depends on context. And I think last year I kind of went through a thing where, you know, I was referring to myself in a lot of different contexts as like a minority group. And I'm thinking, hold up, you're Nigerian. There are 200 million of you. You're the majority of the majority. So I'm talking about myself as a major, uh, as a minority person um, in Norway, where there are just 5 million people. <laughs> so I had to kind of like, hold up, <laughs> what is happening, right? And I think that was when I said, you know, brainstorming and also looking into it. And then seeing that when we say minority, actually, minority is on the basis of number. So realistically, for me as a Black woman who's recently Norwegian, in Norway, it is fair to say that I am a member of the minority group. But outside of Norway, am I a member of the minority group? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, I am from the global majority. And if you view things from a global, global majority perspective, white people are the minority. And I think it's really interesting to reframe that. And this is like, you know, thought leadership that has been coming out of the US for a while because it hits differently when you think about it and also in how we sense our whiteness to see that actually as a white person, you're a minority in the world, even though the world has been framed around whiteness being the majority. So one of the challenges I have, for example, with like BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, People of Color, or BAME, as they use it in the US, uh, sorry, in the UK, which is Black, Asian, and minority ethnic, is that it takes all the diverse people of the global majority and lumps them into one. And then one group of people who are white people just become white people. And then everybody else fits into these three different, you know, uh, acronyms. And I think it's really important to reassess what we think we know uh, on phrases like, you know, who's a minority. Um, sometimes it's used as a catch-all to talk about people who are underrepresented or marginalized because you can be from an underrepresented or marginalized group and not be a minority. And I think those are the things we need to get into our heads, you know? Um, so I think, I, I guess, in, in thinking about how we can use more inclusive language uh, in 2023, I really think it also comes back to not centering ourselves as the norm and asking ourselves questions on the basis of, you know, who are we talking about or who are we referring to? I had a podcast recently with somebody and, you know, they were saying something along the lines about how they were tired of always just focusing on minority issues and minority issues. And then he had to realize that actually he's a minority person because he's white, right? Looking from a global majority. So a lot of the issues that we actually center in the world, oftentimes we say, oh, these are just minority problems, but they're not. They're problems of the global majority. And for that reason, we have to actively figure out how do we do this work? How do we include a different perspective? And how do we include every single person, not just people from the underrepresented or marginalized group, but also white people, for example, is how do we do inclusion for the 100% of people? 
It's a female. Um, somebody's unmuted. It would be great if you could mute yourself. I have muted them, I think. Okay. Thank you so much, Chisam. It's so much to think about and just like challenge our own thought processes and what we think we know. Moving on to you, Astrid. Um, we all know that if you engage more than superficially with DEIB, we quickly realize that DEIB is not fun. But uh, there seems to be a focus on making DEIB fun and more palatable so as not to ruffle feathers or challenge others. Uh, whether intentionally or not, this is problematic. So Astrid, how much fun do you think DEIB should be? Um, it's a really good question, thank you. Um, <clears throat> DIB roles, um, my personal opinion at least, is that um, the most important part of the role is a, a commitment to continuous learning and figuring out solutions for, for impact and for meaningful change. So even though DEI work takes place within the confines of a workplace, let's consider that it is part of a much bigger movement. It's inextricably linked to organized systems of colonialism, slavery, and a, a ruling elite who've perpetuated the idea of white supremacy. So, meaning for, so for meaningful change to happen, this work is about challenging the status quo in monolithic companies where things are rigid and homogenous and Quite frankly, I just don't see what is fun about that. Anyone who describes a role like this as fun is potentially missing the point. Um, so this is a really good question. And I would say that to call DEI work fun is to be deeply unaware of your own privilege. If you really understand and resonate with the reasons that these roles exist as an antidote to um, injustice, to um, oppression, to rampant discrimination, to the destruct destructive nature of systemic bias and climate change, then I think we'd all think twice about using words like amazing or fun. And there are not many people in Norway doing these roles. So just thinking back to my own experience, I, I felt very humbled um, when, I, um, when I got this role at Alder. And I remember a lot of people telling me that they thought it was really cool oh, it's so cool, Astrid, that you've got this role. And, and that bothered me um, because even though I know it was a well-meaning comment, I don't think it is the right framing to call it cool. If we refer to the existence of a leadership program, for example, that, that sponsors people with intersectional identities because they're disadvantaged, is that cool? Is it okay to call it cool? It's, it's far from cool that these initiatives need to exist. And so I think labeling this um, as fun or cool comes from the absolute privilege of not knowing what oppression is. It becomes too saviorism oriented. It becomes too wrapped in toxic positivity. Um, I know a lot of people who might mean this in a well-intentioned sense, but I just think words matter and there's a, a right way of using adjectives to applaud or, or engage in the work. Of course, we can make the work motivational and aspirational from a learning point of view. We can um, open up people's eyes to understanding how the world really is. Epiphanies like global majority that Chisholm just mentioned. And we can really cultivate an understanding of how disadvantage creates chaos and and fairness and I think those eye-opening moments can of course be very powerful and enable people to feel engaged and connected and want to participate and perhaps those awakening moments can be described as amazing or whatever but I would never describe Dr Panima's new book as a cool new book I would say it's groundbreaking I would say it's important I would say it's something that challenges the status quo and before you think I'm a boring humorless killjoy <laughs> Of course, you can have a laugh and you can have a laugh at work and at home and, and, and you know, before these sessions and you're in them. But there just has to be uh, a place for that because this work is it's sobering. It's not exciting. And there's a there's a brilliant um, DI thought leader 
in this space recently who who talked about this focus on good vibes in DEI. And um, Dr. Sam Ray said that it's what makes companies stagnant and complacent. She sort of questioned these good vibes of DEI and, and said that ultimately this work directly impacts people's lives. So really let's think before we use labels like cool or fun and, and stick to using those words in applicable contexts. Thank you so much. I was going to say thank you so much, Isam. <laughs> thank you so much, Astrid. Um, that uh, language is so important, like the language we use, and you know, just to be more inclusive of and reflect on the language we're using. That's so important. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is for Dr. Purnima again. Um, Purnima, your book, uh, your recent book, it focuses on the seven behaviors of active allyship. And we know that everyone can be an ally depending on the context. So in learning now to be a better ally, we have a two-part question for you. Uh, we know it's not enough to have black squares or like include pronouns in our email signature or not have a problem with that one gay friend. Um, but what is allyship in practice and how does it differ from passive allyship? And the second part of the question is, what is the place of an ally in a movement or an ERG? Oh, lots of great, both great questions. Um, I actually am going to start off by maybe picking up on uh, some points from Chisholm and Astrid that I'd like to address first, um, and then I'll move on to answering that question. I think, um, you know, even in, in my work over the years in DEI, I've also had to question the use of the word minority majority and really question who is a minority, who's majority with regards to a global context. In one of my university courses at CBS um, that I teach on um, culture and cultural diversity, I show a slide where if you shrunk the world down into a hundred people, what those, um, proportions would look like. It's a very powerful um, powerful set of numbers and I'll try and dig it out a little later and maybe put it in the chat, but it's quite sobering and humbling uh, when we think about minority majority and it's made me re-question this. And I think there are a couple of questions in the, in the chat around what language should we be using. And so what I've landed with, um, and, and I'm, I feel quite comfortable using this language around it, is I actually think that no one term can uh, can kind of qualify all of what we want to say. So I use three and I use them together in, in my books, um, underrepresented, marginalized and discriminated. And I feel that in that, in three terms are uh, used together, that it really covers the essence of what we're trying to address here when we talk about allyship, when we talk about inclusion. And, and it's important that these are three words that that stand alone, uh, underrepresented, marginalized, discriminated. And, I, and they're, they're slightly different from each other, but they also together collectively cover what Chisholm was talking about. So moving ourselves away from that minority my, majority, which is actually a rather simplistic way of looking at things uh, that we've, we've looked at, to really moving into understanding it a little bit more and, and, and being able to capture the true breath, I think, of what we're trying to do as well. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is this work is not fun. And as I say to most of my clients, if you're not getting uncomfortable with me in my bias awareness sessions, in my DI sessions, in my keynotes, then I haven't done my work. And I would happily give my keynote speaker feedback. This requires us to get uncomfortable. You need to wriggle in your seat. And I hope you're wriggling through this session as well, because it's only when we're wriggling that we know that we are that things are hitting us, that we're really trying internally to come to terms with it and trying to unpack ourselves as well. So just to, you know, just to bring that up and relate it to what Astrid said, look, the, there's a lot of discomfort in this, world, in this work. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, know that you are on the right track. That's when, if you're feeling comfortable, you're, you're not doing enough. So th this is a litmus test, if you'd like, of whether DI practitioners, all of us are really doing the work, even for ourselves, even for the three of us, 
in this space, we have to constantly ask ourselves, am I getting uncomfortable? Because it's only when I'm getting uncomfortable that I'm able to then show up and uh, in that vulnerability in, and continue my learning journey as well. So now to come to the questions. So allyship, right? So allyship is a verb and, and it's a relatively new term. So I want to define it because I think that it's not always well understood and I don't want to make an assumption that everyone understands the term allyship. So allyship comes, um, it's, it's been around for a very long time in the English dictionary, primarily in the US and the UK, um, but it really came to light in the late 1960s, early 70s uh, with the Stonewall in uprising uh, riots in the US. And when um, um, heterosexual individuals uh, showed up to support the LGBTQ plus community, they became known as allies, right? And that's where the term gained popularity. But then it had a little bit of a, a, a slump in its usage and it stayed under the, under the radar. And about five years ago, I think it really started coming up again. And there are terms that are closely related to this. So there's allyship, there's advocacy as well. And so in different contexts, people might use these terms interchangeably, uh, but I chose to use the word allyship. I really love the idea of building long, that's a lifelong process of building relationships with people who are different from us, right? People from, it, they could be from underrepresented, marginalized, discriminated groups, but they could also be people with different intersectional identities um, uh, that are not necessarily from marginalized, discriminated, underrepresented groups, but ideally allyship is about lifting others who are from these groups. So it's a lifelong process. And so when we think about allyship, it's important to think about a couple of things. Number one is that it's active and not passive. And that relates very much to your question as well. Passive allyship is what most of us, the vast majority of us are really doing. You know, we believe in DI, we're here, we attend these sessions, but we don't really know what to to do outside of this, right? So we don't need to know when I get into work at lunch, during meetings, when things happen, when I see microaggressions, uh, when I see biases and discrimination, I don't actually know what to do. And so I let things ride. Passive allyship is allowing biases and discrimination, power and privilege, uh, heteronormative uh, norms to just exist, right? And that is passive allyship. And we're, we're all, I'm sure, in some way, been passive allies and maybe even continue to be passive allies. To move as to be active, we need to be engaging in frequent and consistent behaviors. But to be able to engage the behaviors, we need two things before that. So in my active allyship model, I look at three things. You need knowledge, you need the right attitude, and then you need to show up with, with a certain set of behaviors. The first thing is knowledge. We need a deep curiosity to understand, right? So, so much of the unpacking that we have to do, both with our own biases, but also understanding our own history, understanding what colonialism was and its impact on the world, on communities around the world. And, you know, I sometimes get asked this question, oh, but this was such a long time ago. But we're still, you know, holding up many of those structures, systems that are in place. Today, I actually read something on LinkedIn that just blew my mind. It was, um, it was a, a recent um, legislation that's being shifted in, in some parts of the US where, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, so bear with me because I've just read it this morning, that when kidney patients in hospitals, right, are, uh, when they're black patients, there's an extra addition to the formula that's used to, to decide where on the wait list they go. And that's been discriminatory and it puts black patients further down on that wait list because a different formula is used. I mean, just think about that for a moment. I did not know this. When I read it this morning, I'm just like, I sat with it for a moment, like, gosh, it, bias and discrimination is embedded in ways that we don't know. And that is where that deep curiosity comes in to unpack this, to understand, to have the humility to say that I don't know and I need to understand, I need to figure this out. I need to be curious because it's embedded in so many ways. What is the role of slavery? What impact does it have on how structures and systems and privilege and power is embedded in society? So it starts with that knowledge and then the, the attitude, right? The attitude has a lot to do with our own deep reflection around where our biases and discrimination lie. We're all biased, we're not running away from that. 
each one of us is biased. How do we sit with that and come to terms with that? It's quite hard for people to, to realize that I'm biased. And we come, we seem to think that being biased means I'm a bad person, right? But th those are not equal signs, right? We're all biased. And being a good person doesn't mean that we're not also at the same time holding things up, allowing bias and discrimination to continue to exist, structures and privilege to continue to exist. And so we have to start questioning many of the things that we do and where, where we are. And only then can we move to the, to the behaviors itself, right? So deep curiosity, honest introspection, humble acknowledgement, and then we can show up with empathy, with vulnerability, with authenticity, with, and, and to step up to courageous responsibilities as we engage with each other. And those are the seven behaviors that I look at in my book. But, but that's, that's a big part of it is the KAB, knowledge, attitude, and behavior. So that's a pretty good place to start with this. And um, I forget what your quest second question was, sorry. It's always a problem with two part questions. <laughs> I forgot what the second one was. My next question has three parts. <laughs> uh, the second part was, uh, what is the place of an ally? Oh, allyship is so important. You know, I think, you know, the only way we can move the needle, I mean, this is my firm belief, is that we need everyone to step up. We need, you know, whether we call it global majority, global minority, whether we call it well represented and underrepresented, we need everybody to step up. You know, and we need to move the needle. You know, it's not just if you if you think of me as a brown woman who's been through bias and discrimination. Absolutely, I have, but I have a role to play in this for others, for other intersectional identities, so that I can lift, so that I can make space, so that I can question where and what I'm holding up and challenge myself to make and create space for others as well. So it needs everyone. So the role of allyship is is crucial. And it, the beauty of allyship and the word itself, but also what it entails is everyone can do it. Start in your own spheres of influence. Don't think that it needs to be something massive and big. Sometimes in thinking, oh, we have to change the world and there's so many problems in the world, we forget that we can do things in our spaces, in our teams, in the people that we, with the people that we work with, with our families, with friends, with our community. Start small. And, and I strongly believe in the beauty of the ripple effect, right? That there, that there must be in doing good, in, in doing the right thing and being an ally, it will spread. Um, and, and, and I believe very much inherently in the goodness of, of people and the, our inaction or our passiveness comes from not knowing. But today in 2023, there are resources out there to help us. So pick up the, 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 the next article, book, podcast, challenge yourself and, and step up because we need all of us to do it. So I'm right there with you. I'm working on it myself. I'm trying to do what I can do. Uh, and I've got, I'm on a journey just like everybody else. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, I just also want to uh, remind Tiffany. everybody. Yes. Sorry, go on. I wanted to add something uh, add to what Dr. Pornima said. Oh, okay. I'm just going to add that we have eight more questions to go, actually nine, and I want to get through all of them. So if you could keep your answers crisp and short. Sounds good. I'll try. Um, I wanted to just touch on health uh, inequity and what Dr. Pornima talked about in terms of like uh, kidneys. I read, <clears throat> I think I read that today or yesterday. And for me, honestly, it wasn't a surprise. And I see here in the comments that uh, Bianca had said something about uh, uh, birth violence uh, compared, like, relative to white and black people, um, and that black people suffer more violence uh, when they give birth, and uh, prefixed it uh, or, or, or said in the US. Just to reframe that, it's not just in the US, it also happens in Norway. And that's the reality. I think oftentimes what happens in the US, because that's where we hear the most about it or talk about it, you know, we, we center it as a US problem, but it's not. I had an experience when I had my daughter that was so jarring to me that I was absolutely stunned that it happened to me in Norway, you know, and when I was pregnant with my first child, um, 
my sister works in the medical profession in the US. So in preparing to go in to get like an operation uh, before I can give birth, you know, my sister says to me, Chisholm, hey, I hate to bust your bubble, but I need you to remember these phrases, right? And I'm like, yeah, I will never need it. It's always not like the US. Things like that don't happen here. Well, lo and behold, I go to hospital and I am in severe pain, asking for painkillers, you know, just local anesthetics, nothing that goes into my bloodstream. And my doctor completely ignores me. I sat there on the operation table for about 30 minutes and it seemed like forever, basically begging for painkillers because I was in so much pain. And he kept telling me that I'm not in the pain because other women or this is the standard that they give to people. And then at some point, I start remembering what my sister said to me. So I start counting that, do you know, that Black women are more likely to die from childbirth than other women. Like, I basically kind of just went ape shit, excuse my French, and just like saying those things that made me look a little bit like I was losing it, you know. And at some point, I said, you're not going to touch me anymore. And I need my husband to come into the room. My husband is a white man. He comes into the room. He looks at me. I look at him. I say, babe. I need painkillers. My husband looks over to the doctor and says, give her painkillers. And he's like, okay. And then he gives me painkillers. And I'm just like, what if I did not have him to advocate for me? What would have happened to me? You know, so just to clarify that these things happen. And I think it's also, maybe it's the perception that I think medically people think that black people can tolerate more pain (laughs) than others and white people. And that if I need if I'm asking for painkillers because I am in severe pain, then I must be a drug addict and I just need a fix. So just to put that in perspective. Sorry, Shantani. Thank you for sharing that, Chisholm. My next question is for you, Chisholm. It is a three-part question. We've been talking about the norm quite a lot today. So my question is, who, according to you, is the norm on the basis of different diversity dimensions? And does our proximity to the norm make it easier to passively or actively accept it as a status quo? And the third part, should I give you all the parts together? You can try. So the first part is who's the norm. The second part is proximity Proximity to the norm. And yes. the third part is what can what can we do to consciously challenge and reframe the normative and exclusionary status quo? Right. Okay. So who's the norm? I think maybe if we do a little exercise and think on a basis of sex, who is the norm? More than likely, I think we can all agree that maybe the male sex is the norm. On a basis of gender identity, I think people who identify as he, she, Sorry, yeah, he, she, uh, the identities that are the norm. On the basis of sexual orientation, for example, those of us who are uh, heterosexuals are the norm. On a basis of race, depending on context, we can say white people are the norm. On a basis of religion, say in the West, we can say Christianity is the norm. On a basis of, uh, say, geography, we can also say that the West is the norm. The, what, the, what you see in the news are challenges or issues that affect Western countries. And like emerging market countries, you might as well forget that they exist. So I think in uh, um, it's really important to ask ourselves these questions and also recognize in the spaces, depending on our intersectional identities, that we are the norm and the privileges we get from being the norm. So the second part of the question was about proximity and it was something about does uh, uh, our proximity to the norm make it easier to accept this that, that status quo? Absolutely. Like you have to wear the shoe to know where it hurts, right? If you don't wear the shoe, how the heck are you supposed to know that this is a problem? unless you're engaging in the un- uncomfortable conversations and asking the critical questions. You know, so if I even look at myself, do I receive a lot of privileges from my proximity to the norm? Absolutely. You know, my education brings me privilege. The way I speak gives me privilege. The way I look gives me 
privilege, my sexual orientation, my gender identity, absolutely, you know, and the reality as well is that sometimes I know where to use them. I know where to bring something out or where to state something or how to walk into a room and how to show up because I've learned what works for me in the world. And sometimes I leverage that and I'm not always proud of it, but you know, sometimes I have to survive. And I think it's in having that honest conversation with myself and saying, yeah, I, in some cases I'm part of the problem, right? And I think the last one was, how do we consciously challenge? Uh, 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 this norm, reframe the norm. I think it's in looking inward and asking and just accepting where we are part of the problem and then making a conscious effort to question everything. You know, I'm lucky, I think, like from childhood, I was a little bit of that annoying kid in class who asked the, you know, the teacher, but why and how? And I see my three-year-old daughter is doing the same now. Every time I tell her something, she's like, why? Why mommy? But why? I'm like, ah, oh, that's so annoying. But then I also really love it because she's questioning, you know, like the norm. And I can't just say, ah, uh, because mommy said so, right? I have to come up with a legible uh, uh, answer for her, you know? So I think yeah, I think it's in asking uncomfortable conversation and decentering ourselves. Like this work is best when we're not only the beneficiaries of it. How do you show up for other people when you have nothing to benefit? And I think that's what Dr. Pornima also points at when she talks about allyship, active allyship is, I may not have anything to gain for showing up, but I should show up nonetheless because I recognize that I have privilege and I should show up. Thank you so much. Thank you for keeping it short and crisp too. <laughs> Shri, my next question is for you. Uh, Chisholm recently wrote her second Forbes article that uh, highlighted the trend of minimizing DEI leadership roles in the face of an impending recession. Can you provide more context to this and why do you think this is happening and what do companies need to know about the relevance of DEI in all seasons. Thank you. Yeah, um, a great article that um, that Chisholm uh, wrote. It was um, published a couple of weeks ago. It'd be really great if someone could actually um, put a link to it in the chat because I think it's so relevant to what we're discussing today and the themes that both Panima and, and Chisholm are bringing up. Um, so do I think this is happening? Um, yes, I know it is happening. Um, uh, amongst uh, those let go during the prolific sort of downsizings of last year um, at Tesla, for example, were their LGBTQ plus community president and several um, diversity and inclusion program leads. This month, Monster.com has released data in the January 2023 Future of Work report, claiming that 11% of employers this year admit that DEI programs are among the first to go when they cut costs. Um, DEI programs are apparently uh, come second only after company events and bonuses, um, which are the first things to go. So we're seeing it happening globally and the, 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 the trend has also reached the Nordics, which is a shame because we've only just gotten started on this work and we're still figuring out a Norwegian word for equity. So why do I think this is happening? Um, clearly, some leaders don't understand the link between an inclusive workplace culture and bottom line. I mean, I, I thought we did because everyone jumped on that bandwagon after McKinsey published Diversity Matters um, nearly 10 years ago. Um, and as to why this is happening, well, companies are run by ruling elites of people who are making these decisions. Um, in part, I blame it again on this fun factor consideration around DIB being branded as, as, as cool, something luxurious to pick up when the money is good and the hiring programs are in full flow. But the moment we stumble upon hard times, it's suddenly an unimportant add on. And um, there's this disposability and that the worrying part that this message gives out about disposability is that what this really says is that diversity and inclusion stops being a business imperative during a recession, that it was important when profits were high and when that changes, it's no longer important. 
And the preposterous part of this is you can't put diversity and inclusion on hold because of an impending recession. Systemic bias, the corporate patriarchy, inequity, discrimination at work, these things don't stop in a recession for a little break or a little vacation. You know, they, they worsen. Layoffs disproportionately impact people from marginalized groups. So I don't know what company leaders are thinking. The, 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 the seismic change of living through a pandemic and a social justice movement, it taught us so much about inclusion, allyship, hiring, progressing, and promoting people with intersectional identities. And the importance of this to innovation and bottom line has been so long established that company leaders are throwing this away to save money is narrow-minded, it's, it's foolish, it, it, it starts to make the work look like a performative marketing tool. Every part of a successful company ecosystem will be influenced and will be steered by diversity and inclusion. And we know that equitable employers will outpace the competition by a country mile. We already have research from the Great Recession to show that, that um, those companies who preserved or indeed amplified their DEI efforts sailed through the financial crisis of 2007 with a recession-proof survival kit on their backs. And, 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 and just to reinforce that, Great Place to Work have released some really um, important uh, data, which I'll share in the, in, in the chat. It's a 2020 report that shows that companies in the Great Session, Recession who doubled down on their DEI efforts thrived. So think about that and, and couple it with the fact that, you know, HBR came out recently and said 76% of job seekers will ask about the workplace DEI plans and consider it an essential component when they're sizing up, you know, potential employers. It is absurd that companies would take the decision to reduce their DEI capabilities. All they've done is compromise their employee value position, um, proposition and their, their brand story. And that's on top of the fact that some global workplaces have already targeted marginalized talent in the layoff process, effectively erasing this, this um, integral part of the workplace ecosystem. So it's a recipe for disaster. It's loaded with ignorance and short-sightedness and it's worrying. Thank you so much for sharing that, Astrid. Let's hope that 2023 companies do better. Uh, my, my next question is for you, Purnima. Uh, regarding equity, what are some of the equitable strategies that companies and individuals can implement this year? Yeah, so um, there's a lot that companies can do. And there's, of course, evidence from organizations that are doing it that many of these strategies work. Um, but I think I want to start, I want to rewind a little bit that I think I still think um, that not all companies are convinced that they need to put equity on the table. Um, and I think this is hugely damaging. Like I still hear in 2023 um, comments like, well, shouldn't we be thinking about equality instead of equity, right? Um, and I think we need to first understand and really come to terms with the fact that our workplaces and the world, quite frankly, is not experienced in the same way for everybody. And if it's not experienced in the same way, that means people's pathways are very, very different, right? So right from childhood experiences to education, to opportunities um, throughout life up till they hit the workplace are very different. And that means that people have different starting points that they're, that they're starting with, right? Once you enter the workplace, they're also, the workplace itself is experienced very, very differently depending on your intersectional identity. So yes, the E in DEI is for equity, that we first need to put that on the table. We don't live in a world that is just, not just yet at least. I hope one day we will, and I hope in our in my lifetime, but the way the data looks, I don't think that's even a possibility for me or my children. But in this unjust world, in this world that we live in, we need to be putting equity on the table to address the inequity in the systems. And first we need to understand that. So I think before we can think about strategies 
uh, that are equitable, we need to rewind and say that we need leaders and we need the organization to truly believe that equity is necessary. And leaders like all of us who sit with power and privilege, we need to be able to say openly that yes, it's not experienced the same way. And if we can honestly say that, then we'll move the needle forward with saying, all right, now what? The problem we have right now is we can have all these strategies out there, but if we don't believe that we need it, then it's going to be a half-hearted attempt at trying to solve the issues, the challenges. So if we start with that, if we say that we first step is truly believing that equity is needed, and then of course, then the strategies come in, right? Thinking about ERGs, you know, and yes, framing it ERGs and allies, thinking about your promotion and recruitment processes, unpacking how to make those more equitable, thinking about your products and services, thinking about marketing, thinking about customer service, I mean, all of our processes, right? Unpacking it to make sure that there's equity tied into that, to lifting those who who have different pathways, who are um, underrepresented, marginalized, discriminated, addressing all of that. But I also think it goes beyond that. I think I'm starting to see companies really being, I think there it's, it's early days, but reverse mentoring in this space is a great way for leaders who come from well-represented circles, who have enjoyed power and privilege to actually engage in a mentoring program um, being mentored by those from underrepresented, marginalized, or discriminated groups. I think that can be very powerful as, a, as an equity strategy, uh, which is really early days. I'm not seeing many companies doing it, but there are a couple of my clients that are, and they're seeing some really nice positive results coming out of it. And that challenges, but that requires our leaders to lean into that discomfort because it's an uncomfortable process. And it's a, it's a, it's a process that requires us to first sit with there is inequity and we need to address it. The workplace is not experienced in the same way. So I actually, I mean, the strategies are so many and you know, there, there's so much evidence and literature out there, but if you're doing one thing today around equity, first convince people that equity is the pathway forward, that it's necessary. We don't live in an equal world. We don't live in a just world. So equity is the answer. Thank you so much. So moving on to the next question. Chisum, uh, when it comes to measuring initiatives, something I've heard a million times, and I'm sure all of you have heard it a million times, uh, more, especially in the Nordics, you hear companies talk about how difficult it is to measure equity, inclusion, and belonging. So Oftentimes, the work done to elevate equity, inclusion, and belonging, it tends to stop at what diversity dimensions they can measure. Can you speak more on the line of thinking and can we actually measure equity, inclusion, and belonging? Thanks, Shantani. I am aware of the time, so I'm going to try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, <laughs> I, in, in the Nordics, I think you can measure legally age, nationality, and gender. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of companies, you know, coast on this limitation and say, okay, when we are actually trying to measure the impact of our initiative or how diverse, inclusive, or equitable that we are, you know, we can only measure the, you know, the, the, this three dimensions. So there's not much we can do. And I've heard so many leaders and DEI leaders say this. So again, I think I've, I've smashed it a few times in this, like in this panel discussions, I'm just going to smash it again. You can absolutely, absolutely 100% measure equity. You can measure inclusion. You can measure belonging without infringing on people's privacy without breaking any GDPR laws, right? You can measure equity by asking questions that are specific to look at things that are equitable. You can ask questions on inclusion on the basis of, do you feel that your, your, your opinions are value that work? That's an easy yes, no, maybe sometimes answer. You can ask questions around, you know, do you feel that you can voice an opposing view without repercussions. You can gauge 
how safe people feel at the workplace by actually designing surveys or, 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 or data sets to draw out these questions. And we actually do this at Diversify for a lot of our clients. So it is absolutely possible. I, I guess I, I should just end it there. Like it's possible. And, you know, if you've been thinking that it's not, you know, reach out to us and let's talk more about it. Thank you so much. So we have a few more questions left, which hopefully we can cover quickly. Um, my next question is where inclusion is concerned, what are some of the concrete practices people, companies should embed in their 2023 strategy and beyond? Uh, that question is for you, Astrid. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and go as quick as possible. Um, speaking from experience um, of starting um, uh, a, a DI program from scratch in a, in a global blitz scale up two years ago, I think um, one of the concrete practices should be to start somewhere simple. Um, I spent my first few months really understanding that the, the current experience and environment at order, speaking to workers in the warehouse, drivers, people working on the front line, carrying out discrimination risk assessments, and and this is what really helped me to make a start with the, the, the company call to action as a sort of foundational strategy that everyone could connect to. And I was conscious that over complicated pledges, diagrams, dotted lines, 100 page decks of slides, these don't engage some of the most important people in the business. So um, start simple to be effective. And secondly, this this builds a little bit onto what Chisholm was saying around data, fully agree Chisholm, um, analyze the right data. And when it comes to data, don't be too rigid. Don't think it's a, it's a, it's a win-lose situation. You have to trial and you have to iterate and pivot. And sometimes you need to completely change direction on something. And I've done that many times in the last two years. Also in the data, don't just focus on the good results. Um, the, the, the majority who give 10 out of 10 to inclusion and belonging, try to focus on reaching those who don't. And look at your talent pipeline data, who starts, who leaves, why they leave, who doesn't return after parental leave, who, who leaves during a, a layoff process, have this sort of experimental mindset. The last thing I'd say is, um, I think organizations need to have qualified and experienced people um, driving this work. Um, in order for DEI programs to succeed. So it, it could be uh, an external consultant helping to sort of train and lead your existing people, or it could be someone, you know, in-house. This is not a role for a, a rookie or for someone with inexperience or, or just for someone who is woke and passionate or thinks this is cool. It's a responsibility that requires in-depth knowledge. You know, DEI leaders often end up off the glass cliff. So they, they, they need this authority with them, with their responsibility because they need to hold top management accountable for, for reaching the targets. And this means that every C-suite and leadership table should be having regular deep dive discussions on this work at their management meetings and really embed it into the, the, the business imperative company goals and objectives. Thank you so much, Astrid. Um, along the same lines, uh, Dr. Purnima, uh, what do you think employees and individuals uh, can do in 2023 to co-create an environment that is inclusive and fosters allyship with all people and intersectionalities? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot that we can do. And of course, that's, the, uh, that's covered uh, very much in, in my book. But I think if there's one thing that you should start with is challenging yourself, challenge yourself to, to move away from what you assume to know, um, keep asking those questions about others and their experiences, not directly straight to their face, but you know, have it at, at the back of your mind, read actively, engage in conversations, attend sessions like this, um, get different perspectives, but really challenge yourself and sit with the discomfort. You know you're making progress if you're uncomfortable. While in so many other, we are so well trained in the business space that you know uncertainty, all of those things are things that we 
don't necessarily like. We want to move away from that. We want control. In DEI, it's okay. It's necessary. It's part of the journey and it's healthy. It means we're moving in the right direction. So sit with the discomfort. Um, remember that Chisholm, Astrid, and I are also getting uncomfortable with you in our own journeys. So you're not alone when we're here to help. And there's lots of others around the world who are. Um, but we're also seeking each other's help. Um, and we're also seeking to learn as well. So get uncomfortable this year. Let 2023 be the year you get uncomfortable. And know that I'm getting uncomfortable with you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Fonua. That's so important. Chisum, mm, my next question is for you. Why is it important to continuously and critically assess our DEIB initiatives on an ongoing basis? Um, I think because as long as we're living, breeding human beings, like things change, we live and learn, you know, and if you have not learned anything new or been challenged or uncomfortable in a few months while we're doing this work, then you're not doing this work, you know? And I think, you know, what Dr. Purnima just alluded to in terms of like, you need to be uncomfortable to get this right. And I think it's important as well to continually assess our different initiatives because maybe even the way we practiced or the really great, you know, hundred slide documents that we sent out and we're super proud of had ableist language in it. But now we know better and then we have to reframe. For example, like how many of us here still say lame and, you know, um, that's dumb? Um, how many of us say that? You know, how many of us say things in sentences like she turned a blind eye to me, you know, like those words are ableist. Recently, I was talking about blind recruitment and how, you know, uh, uh, beneficial it could be in certain contexts. And I'm talking about something that is great and should technically be inclusive. And on the other hand, uh, or at the same time, it's ableist because it's blind recruitment. Like what, what do blind people have to do with recruitment? So I think the need to continually assess and check ourselves, I think it's part of the process because that is how that is how we learn and then look for ways to say things better, to do things better. And I think in the process of learning and unlearning and relearning, we should also be honest about it. And we should be able to say like, if you heard me talk about this like six months ago, I think I had it all together, but no, I didn't. I was messing up, you know, left, right and center. And I think that's part of the process because it normalizes our humanity. It also normalizes the fact that we make mistakes. It demystifies the shame that often comes with doing this work where like, oh, you're not doing it enough. Mm, we don't like you. We're going to cancel you, you know? So I think it normalizes you know, that it's a process and no one gets it right 100% of the time. Thank you so much, Jason. Just being empathetic in this work is also so important. Um, round up this round and uh, move into the Q&A. My last question is for all of you. Uh, could you share one to three top tips of DEIB mistakes to avoid in 2023? Astrid, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to say um, leaders who select when to wear their DEI hat and only acknowledge it in a crisis or in a, you know, in the socio-political climate when something's happened. Um, that selective hat wearing screams disinterested and uh, performative. Um, secondly, I'm going to say flaky commitment, um, diversity and inclusion roles being dropped and capabilities being reduced or shoved um, during times of financial hardship. Um, and lastly, um, I'm just going to sort of bring two take home hashtags from today that I think um, Chisholm and Purnima have generated. One is uh, hashtag passively accepted norms. So thank you for that take home Chisholm. 
And I think the other one, um, Punima, is hashtag let's get uncomfortable together. Thank you so much, Astrid. Uh, Dr. Purnima? I'll keep it brief. I know I've, I've, uh, I've, I've spoken a lot. So I have two things, or oh, actually three, sorry, three things. Uh, stop staying in your comfort zone. Stop being passive and don't keep DI be separate in your strategy. Three things for me. Thank you. Chisa? Uh, yes, uh, things that come to mind, I think Astrid and I do agree with what Astrid and Dr. Pornima said, uh, just to round up, I would say you don't know what you don't know, like even if you think you know, you don't know, so listen to understand, not respond, because you don't know what you don't know, um, and for companies, don't be quick to let go of your DEI leaders. We see you, we know what you're doing, that explanation doesn't fly, I'm just saying, like it's... I'm saying it for all of us who maybe don't get a chance to say it, you know, DEIB is season agnostic and it's relevant in all seasons. And especially when things are bad, when you're letting a bunch of people go, you need somebody, you need a program, you need an initiative that actually hugs, caters, supports people within your company. As Dr. Pornima said, and also I think Astrid leaning into the discomforts. If you're not uncomfortable, you're not doing the work. And just lastly is, uh, uh, um, it's really important to not only celebrate your, the majority opinions when it comes to DEI initiatives in the workplace. And I talk about this in one of my Forbes article, where oftentimes companies, when they run surveys or assessments about, uh, say, inclusion, and 80% of the company is happy, they're like, oh, 80% of us are happy, so we're good. You know, we're doing well. Actually, you should celebrate that 80%, but also be curious about the 20%, because that 20% is your opportunity to be more inclusive inclusive. That 20% shows you where you have holes that needs to be filled. So don't only just celebrate that 80%. Be grateful for that 20% and then get to work. So that's it. Thank you so much to all of you for all the insights and all the things that you said that we all need to sit and reflect on now. Uh, moving on to the questions. We have quite a few questions. I know Chisam and uh, I, all of you have answered a few in the chat. Uh, but I can go to the first one that we got. Um, there has been a discussion that diversity is represented by every single person. As, as we are all different, is this what diversity is? Can you define the differences between diversity and simply being different from anyone? This is for everybody, I guess. Anybody who wants to take this can take I, it. I can start and then uh, Chisholm and Astrid, you can, you can um, uh, jump on it. So when we look at the term diversity, diversity refers to differences, right? And within the DEI space, um, there are, of course, different definitions when it comes to diversity. But diversity is really about those differences. So actually, those terms, those phrases um, are, are very much interlinked to each other. Yes, when we talk about diversity, we're talking about the differences. But I think it's important for us to add the intersectional piece here, um, that these differences intersect with each other. And I think it's important also to understand why are we looking at this diversity? What is the ne necessity for us? So a couple of things. One is adequate representation, right? So our organizations need to represent society or outside. And if they're not representing society, then we need to question why that is the case um, and what is happening. And then our societies also need to be thinking about what representation looks like at various different levels, including in government as well and as in, in pol policy makers as well. Now, diversity within the workplace is not just about identifying these differences, but also in saying that people's experiences of the workplace differ on the basis of their identities. And that's why diversity is so important. And that's why the intersectional piece related to diversity is so important. So very often we get hung up on, you know, those numbers and those data points, right? And of course, as, as, as Astrid and Chisholm have said, it's important to collect data, but it's also not 
it's not sufficient for us to only collect surface level diversity data, right? We also have to look at the invisible aspects. And, you know, Adidas has actually done some really nice work here in trying to get access into data around diversity that is both anonymous um, and voluntary. So that, uh, you know, the biggest complaint that we hear, oh, there's GDPR and in this region, we can't collect data. But, you know, there are creative ways about getting around this. Now, it's not just enough to say, oh, we have this percentage who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, or we have this, our, our gender, uh, uh, you know, representation in our organization looks like this. It's about how, what happens when you put those diversity dimensions together and they intersect with each other. That is where the magic of diversity lies, but that's also where biases and discrimination lies. So if you can look at diversity from that intersectional lens, that is crucial. So diversity is, yes, it is about the differences, but it's more than just the differences in isolation. It's the differences in intersection. So that's the beauty of diversity. It's like a web, right, of all these different dimensions coming together. So we need to, and that's the title of my first book, Diversify Diversity. Thank you so much, Dr. Purnima. I can move on to the next question. and. Uh, so the next question was, uh, do you know of any online training or certification programs you could recommend for a DEI manager? I think Chisom has answered that. Diversify offers DEI trainings for managers as well as we do train the trainer coachings. So you can reach out to us at deib at diversify.no or you can also email Chisom directly at Chisom, C-H-I-S-O-M, at the rate diversify.no. Uh, it's in the chat in case you want to see it. Um, the next question is for Astrid. Uh, Astrid, you mentioned that it is important to keep DEI strategy simple. Could you share an example of a non-simple strategy? Just, just so I understand, uh, an, an example of a non-simple strategy? Yes. A 100-page deck of slides that's unrelatable? Um, that's the, the, the best example I can share. Have I understood the question correctly, that it was a non-simple example that was being yes. asked? Yes, yes. Have I interpreted yes. that wrongly? No, I think you've interpreted it right. Yes, uh, it was me, the one who asked the question, if I can just uh, clarify. It's because yes. sometimes uh, it's, uh, let's say, we can think about, you mentioned that sometimes you only have to have four elements, but sometimes even in one simple element, it might be extremely complex. I just, uh, I, I want to know how do we define simplicity? Because it's not about the number, Sometimes it's about what we are trying to achieve. Then that okay. was my question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for adding more um, context to that. I appreciate it. Um, I think it would boil down again to this relatability. Is it relatable for uh, the type of organization you are? I mean, there is no possibility of answering this question in a sort of one size fits all because every single approach will be different based on the, the company and the context and the, the, the type of organization it is. So. I think that um, to answer your question, um, keeping it simple would really have to fit and match and suit and mesh and embed, which is a word that we've heard Punimi use time and time again today with the organization that you're that you're working for. I, I hope that helps to add some some context and Chisholm Punima feel free to free to add anything onto that if you'd like to. I just wanted to say context matters. So it's difficult. What's simple for one person might not be for another. So you have to look at the local context in which you are working and designing and make it as simple as possible for that context. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I just add that and emphasize that vocabulary matters? Um, I, I shared an article in, in the chat as well around, uh, you know, uh, global uh, or localizing your DEI strategy, right? And and when you think about, you know, very much what Chisholm and Astrid have said that, you know, context matters, 
And it matters in many different ways from role models that we use, but also language and vocabulary. Don't assume that you know, vocabulary that is well understood in one place will be understood in others as well. So when creating a DI strategy, sometimes the complexity comes from using language and vocabulary that are not well understood across local languages, dialects. Um, and so it's really important to translate without, without you know, translate naturally, translate in a way that is not making the other party feel that, you know, they, they don't know enough or anything like that, or there's a superiority there. It's not, not about that. It's about just naturally translating things into vocabulary that is able to be understood um, across a global organization, particularly in global settings. I think this is hugely important. Vocabulary is, is key. I think with DI, I find that a lot of people actually are scared of engaging on it because the terminology is not familiar. What does allyship mean? What is intersectionality? What is, you know, even, even equity, inclusion? What are the differences? What is tokenism? There's so much in our vocabulary. None of us learned this in school. This was not part of the spelling and vocabulary list that I grew up with, right? We've all learned this later, which means we need to have the empathy to understand that you know when we talk about DI strategies they need to have vocabulary that are that is easy to be understood by by everyone and yeah just to just to quickly add something to that I have a friend who uses some of the biggest adjectives in the world to explain something simple and I always wonder and I ask him sometimes like why like are you trying to prove a point that you're smarter than the rest of us I don't get it you know and I think uh, in economics, and I, I reckon it's maybe in different fields, we say layman terms, which basically builds on the fact that every single person, who even people who've never heard about something, should be able to understand it. So one of the ways I frame it is kind of just like, if my daughter can understand me, then I'm saying it the right way, you know? And then if, of course, there are words where we have to say the big words, but also make an effort to actually explain and break it down for the context you're in. And Chisholm, if I can just add, maybe we should be calling that laypersons. Absolutely, layperson, because laymen said, absolutely, right on. Thanks, Astrid. <laughs> the things that we don't spot until they come up. Yeah, our language is so gendered, it's, it's, yeah. it's remarkable, but yes, layperson. I think we should also make that word itself extinct, because actually, lay, actually, what does that mean? That creates power as well for someone who actually know something or who is an expert in something compared to someone else so I actually I dislike that word in itself because you know what does that mean like lay what, what does that mean like it's you know I think it stems from this real power distance between people of experts and knowledge centers versus others so I think it's just about simplifying language right so that everyone understands and um, I was just about to type it in the chat that for academics one of the biggest um, tests for us is that if we can explain a theory to a five-year-old then we have we are we get a tick mark right like that yes you've understood that concept right so we try to sometimes overcomplicate things but if we can just simplify it down so I think these days even five-year-olds teach us much more than than anyone else at least you know my kids do I don't have a five-year-old anymore I wish I did uh for extra hugs but um they teach us so even a five-year-old is probably smarter than than us yeah it speaks to the importance of decolonizing academia because this is also a huge problem within uh the systems the academic system and structures exactly okay going on to the next question we have quite a few comments and questions on uh, LinkedIn too. So this one is from LinkedIn. Mm, we often talk about what strategies organizations can should implement to develop more inclusive policies and practices. But isn't it also important to talk about how to actively work to build trust and address any trauma that un, uh, that undeserved individuals may have experienced within the workplace? And what is the most important thing to do for an organization to build trust so people can believe changes will happen and embrace them? That's a loaded question for anybody that's who a, wants to take it. That's a big question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is shifting power. And when we're able to shift power, we also shift the focus on the type of conversations 
that we're having. So I think the conversation, uh, uh, the question maybe hinted on rather than focus or in addition to focusing on like initiative of also focusing on uh, the challenges that marginalized groups or underserved communities face and how they lose trust within the system. And I mean, I, I would absolutely, I, yeah, this is something I'm still working on. And sometimes I have to explain to people, you know, when I go into workplaces and, you know, they say we've done a lot to create, you know, say psychological safety. We've done a lot to create like safer spaces. And then I tell them, listen, as the only black person in this space, there is nothing you can do to make me feel safe. So there's also something to be said about like representation. Like you can make me feel safe to a point, but that 100% uh, 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 safety is not something that, you know, uh, uh, I can easily just accept because I know how different groups of people, depending on the intersectional identities they wear, suffer within the workplace. But oftentimes we're not even able to speak about it and this is this goes beyond like race this also goes across you know say sexual orientation for example like if if how does somebody disclose you know their pronouns if it potentially outs them and if it potentially brings them harm you know so it, it's a really difficult one to crack so i think maybe we can start with the shifting power I think that's a really good place to start and giving, uh, making sure that the people who actually need to create the solutions they seek and the safety they seek are represented and are leading those initiatives. First things that come to mind, but Dr. Ponyman, Astrid, don't know if you want to add something here. I'll just add something really quickly. Um, that is that um, I think it's a really good question, by the way. Thank you. Um, Psychological safety means different things to different people. Um, how I've seen it play out positively in a work context, and, and this has happened at Audit, is leaders who take the initiative to ask in a one-to-one -one basis, what is psychological safety for you? How can I create that? How can I cultivate that? How can I support you on that? Because then we can avoid these sort of generic terms that psychological safety is this for everyone, whereas I think it is just so different. So for leaders, I think it could be to have that one-to-one uh, -one dialogue with your um, individual reports. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, when setting up ERGs for underrepresented groups, in this case, the LGBTQIA plus community, how does one reach those who are hidden and may wish to participate, but may not be outed? Uh, have you any suggestions also for supporting employees who are located in countries where merely existing is illegal? I want to nominate Dr. Pornima to answer this. I have some thoughts, but I've read her book and it's really good. And I think she should answer this one. <laughs> oh, this is, this is a big one, right? So Given that 83, approximately 83% of countries, in 83% of countries around the world, it is actually illegal still in 2023 to be part of the LGBTQ plus community, to be um, open about your uh, sexual orientation, a gender identity. Um, it is, uh, we have a long way to go. And so um, I'm going to share an example from one of my clients. I'm not going to name the client uh, to protect them. Um, but in countries where uh, they are based, where it is illegal, um, the company has internally made it safe for people to come through their doors and then to change. So for example, um, in, in that company that there are two examples. One is related to the LGBTQ plus community and the other one is, is uh, a religion, religious related um, challenges that, that they face within that environment. So in the first, it's a, it was, it's a trans man uh, who's an employee of theirs um, who is not out outside, um, but feels safe to be out inside the workplace. And so comes to work as a woman and then changes um, in terms of clothes, in terms of, uh, of what the person wears and their pronouns internally. Um, and, and the person feels safe, you know, uh, thinking about psychological safety, Astra, that's such an important point that it's different to different people. For this person, that's the safety. That's what psychological safety looks like. 
Um, the other example that this particular co company, uh, you know, offering this has also created is that um, for, for women who are required to wear the hijab by state law, not out of choice, I think at the end of the day, it needs to be about choice, but is it where they're not allowed um, to not wear the hijab out of choice uh, outside, that they are within the office allowed to be who they want to be, who they are without repercussions. Um, but this is, of course, every company is to assess risk here. There, there is a risk to this um, for the company, for leaders. So it's, it's, you know, I'm not saying that this is the way. And I'm, again, I'm not naming companies. I'm not naming context either, because it is so dependent on the risk appetite of the company, how much they truly believe um, in this. Um, I have another case, another client of mine, where um, in, in Eastern Europe and Certain, uh, certain countries within Eastern Europe where um, there are certain laws and legislation as well that challenges um, LGBTQ plus marketing uh, with open marketing around it. Um, there are clients of mine who take a stand, a corporate stand, that no matter where we are, this is what we stand for and this is what we, uh, we will use in terms of imagery, in terms of representation and, and also in terms of narratives as well. As well. What's really interesting in both the clients is they saw a dip in customers in the very initial period of pushing this through uh, but the, actually in the in the medium term not even long term in the in the short to medium term they're actually their sales have have actually uh, gone up significantly so yes they've seen a dip but if if leaders can have that risk appetite to say we're doing the right thing we're standing by our value system um, and pushing through with that so just a couple of cases there of companies that are doing this, but of course I also understand it's challenging. And I want to end off with actually a personal story of my own. Um, that you know, when I do keynotes in different parts of the world, I also need to be careful. Um, and I actually had this moment where I was asked by a client to speak at a, a in a part of the world where um, it you know it's it's still illegal to be a part of the LGBTQ plus community. But the client had asked me to speak uh, during Pride Month. Um, and, and I had to sit with this for a moment because it felt inauthentic to not be able to say what I want to say and what I say in other contexts. Um, and I had a really good chat with a colleague of mine who is part of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and she said to me that, look, at the end of the day, uh, while we want to stay authentic to who we are, we also want to stay out of jail. <laughs> so, you know, we need to in some ways balance it. So I did speak at the event, but I altered some of it or I just spoke in more general terms rather than using examples, but hoping that the audience still was able to connect with that. So I think it's it's such a I don't have a clear answer on this one, but I hope in the in the examples I've given you, hopefully that gives you some food for thought as well. Um, Chisel Mastered, please feel free to add on to this. Oh, I just wanted to add the hashtag that um uh, so DEI is not fun and DEI is also risky. <laughs> so there you go. Right. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have today. But we have a lot of questions on LinkedIn and on here, thanking you all for the great conversation and for giving us so much to think about. So thank you so much for today's conversation. And um, yeah, we all we also I can um, yeah I want to add another thing. <laughs> uh, we have our next DNI session ready. Uh, it is on the twenty second of February, and it is up on our website, so you can register for our next session. We don't have the speakers yet, but we will put them out soon. I'm putting it in the chat, so if you want to register, you can. Thanks so much, Anthony. I think you did really well. Thank you so much. Really and well. thanks a lot to Astrid and Pornima. This was a lot of learnings and I was trying to take us, like I took a lot of notes. Um, so thank you both for this. This was great. And also for the, to the attendees and participants. Thank you for being here, both on LinkedIn and also on Zoom. Really appreciate your time. <laughs>